Thank you, Chairman. And it's very, it's my honor to see you, everybody here, and uh, it's my honor to uh, give a talk here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament, its prevalence, management, and prognosis. This is a review paper that focused on uh, serial research, so researches of our team in the past 10 years. And uh, I've been joined uh, the G Journal of Neurosurgery Spine editorial board since last year. And uh, OPL has been one of my uh, research interests. So I would like to begin this review by uh, answering following questions. Should we treat CSM surgically? And should we treat CSM that was caused by the OPL surgically? If so, then when should we do the surgery? And we use the national uh, insurance database to convert, uh, to conduct this study. We look at the patients uh, who had cervical spondylotic myelopathy and that has surgery. And you can see after surgery, the incidence of spinal cord injury has decreased. So uh, managing managing cervical spinal myelopathy without surgery will increase the spinal cord injury rate to by 1.6 uh, 1.6 times that's the adjusted hazard ratio and uh, we did another study to look at uh, patients with cervical spondylotic myelopathy and uh, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament so we group patients uh, into two groups, uh, one with uh, CSM with OPLL and CSM without OPLL. Then each of the group would be divided into those uh, treated conservatively and treated surgically. So the conservative management and versus the surgery group. And you can imagine uh, patients with CSM and that has no OPL who has surgery had the lowest uh, rate or incidence risk of subsequent spinal cord injury. On the opposite, those patients who had cervical spondylotic myelopathy and uh, OPL and treated conservatively during the following 10 years would have uh, the highest risk of cervical, uh, cervical spinal cord injury. So this is a comparison table that demonstrates that uh, using the patients who had cervical spondylotic myelopathy without OPLL as a reference, then uh, those patients who had uh, OPLL causing CSM and had no surgery would have had uh, almost three times of a uh, risk to, of su subsequent spinal cord injury. And also, this, uh, there's differences in age. So the female patient who had CSM without OPLL had the lowest rate uh, if treated surgically. And on the other hand, a male patient who had CSM caused by OPL and had no surgery will have uh, at least three times risk of cervical sp spinal cord injury. And by this demonstration, you can see um, surgery at least at least reduces the subsequent risk of spinal cord injury by half, 50 percent. So uh, surgery should be uh, advocated in patients with uh, OPL and CSM. So what if the pa OPL patients were treated without surgery? And is the risk of spinal cord injury increased if these patients were treated conservatively? Uh, this is another paper that we published uh, years ago. Again, we use the national insurance database to look at uh, patients who had OPL and comparing these patients to age sex matched cohort, those control patients who had no OPL. And uh, in following years, you can see there's dramatic differences. In a comparison group, the, uh, in the means the normal group, the 
spinal cord injury incidence is quite low. On the other hand, the OPL group had a, a high incidence rates of spinal cord injury. The adjusted hazard ratio is 32, uh, 32. so it's 32 times risk for those patients who had OPL if managed conservatively. On the other hand, if you look at a complete spinal cord injury, the risk is more, even higher. So when you see a patient in your clinic who comes with a, 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 a OPL, even though the symptom might be minor, I think we can uh, we can we have the evidence to show that uh, these patients should be treated if there are symptoms, and uh, because the following spinal cord injury risk would be uh, 100 100 times higher than those who had no OPLL. This is another. Uh, this is another um, paper that we we did to look at the incidence of OPL, and we all know that uh, incidence of of OPL in Eastern Asian countries are higher than those uh, Caucasian ethics. And uh, as you can imagine, that it, for males, males have higher incidence rates of OPL than female patients. And uh, as the age increases, the incidence of OPL also increased. So again, uh, male patients had uh, had higher incidence of OPL, especially the uh, older age male. So, using this cohort from uh, of 10, uh, I mean 11 years, from 1997 to 2007, the incidence rate of OPL admission in Taiwan is 6.1 per uh, per one million person year, and uh, it's the prevalence prevalence rate is 7.7 7 .7 per uh, 10, I mean 100,000. Person years, and also the higher incidence, higher incidences are observed in elderly and male patients, which implies the degenerative nature of this disease. So, it's it's quite intuitive that for us to think uh, OPL patients are it's a uh, it's apparently a de degenerative disease, and uh, and I know there are. Uh, there are multiple debates and choices of a surgical approaches for OPL with CSM. It's a classical debate whether you want to go from anterior or posterior or even combined. There are pros and cons for uh, each approaches. And I, for what we did in, in our team in Taipei, uh, we, we mainly focused on, um, we, we will choose anterior approach for short segment uh, um, OPL like this one, and maybe add on another uh, osteoplasty. This was published in uh, two years ago. And also, for example, like this one, this one, uh, someone would argue this could be done by ACDF. I think for this piece of OPL should be removed anteriorly. And on the other hand, there are such kinds. Of, uh, this is the post-op, the, the previous patient, the, the post-op film, as you can see, the, the after the copectomy, the, the core re-expands pretty well. But of uh, how about for severe long uh, the, the figures I show was uh, segmental OPLs, but on the other hand, for severe and long continuous type of OPL, I think uh, such as this one, I know maybe many of uh, you have different opinions. I just want to show what we tend to do uh, in these years because the OPL is so long and so uh, looks very uh, quite scary. So we tend to do posterior first. And after posterior uh, decompression and fixation, maybe we can reduce the, the segment of anterior approach or the extent of anterior approach can be shortened from anterior. So this is the pre-op uh, uh, films. You can see every segment is, every level is quite stenotic. So this is what we did. Uh, we did a posterior long laminectomy and fixation then with a short or selected uh, uh, anterior copectomy. 
So we tend to do a combined anterior posterior, but posterior first, then anterior for severe long segment OPL. And this is the this is the post up one year post up MRI in this patient. You can see by by doing the posterior, we we did not have to attack the uh, anterior, uh, the upper most end, which is which is quite difficult. So I would like to make a summary that this is just a, a review of our our work that focused on CSM and OPL in the past 10 years. And uh, we tend to uh, advocate early surgery for OPL patients uh, since as long as it's symptomatic, I think I uh, should uh, consider surgery because the subsequent spinal cord injury risk would be higher if managed uh, conservatively. Also, there are various surgical approaches, and uh, uh, I'm not saying anyone is better because there are a lot of literature debating on this topic, but I think uh, for, for in my hands, I tend to go anterior for short segments and uh, go posterior plus anterior for long continuous type OPL. Thank you very much.